Median house prices in Perth will reach the $1 million mark in under three years, and Sydney will reach the $2 million mark, according to Oxford Economics. In this episode, we'll talk why this will happen, whether I think it's realistic. Also, we'll talk about distress listings, whether you can still buy under $500,000 in Perth, how to make the most of these price movements, and we'll go through every other city as well. Let's go. My name's PK, and I help people build passive income through the Property Investment Accelerator using data without needing a $15,000 buyer's agent every single time this channel. We expose the reality of the economy, the property market, and financial happiness. Hit the subscribe button and give it a like. That really helps me and my channel. Thanks, guys. Let's go. So here it is from the Australian Financial Review. Sydney median house price to hit 2 million, Perth 1 million by 2027. Now this report is sometimes bullish, sometimes bearish. Let's ignore these headlines and get into why. Marie McIlroy from Oxford Economics, a senior economist, said that despite high interest rates eroding affordability, a fundamental undersupply of dwellings has created upwards price pressure across all markets. We'll dive into this in a sec. By the way, the legitimacy of Oxford Economics, when I was the head of strategy at Virgin Australia, we actually used to hire Oxford Economics, and I found them to be very balanced in their views, international in their perspective, and not really clickbaity, not bought out or biased towards any sector or industry. They're truly global. You have a fundamentally undersupplied market with net overseas migration running at half a million people, a growing participation by foreign buyers, downsizers, and cash buyers. Demand has outweighed the drag that interest rates would typically have. And here are the price forecasts. So in Sydney, they expect the median price over three years by June 2027 to be $1.93 million. That's a percentage growth from today's prices, 2024, of 18%. Melbourne will go up to 1.28 million, 21% increase. Brisbane, 1.21 million, 19% increase. Adelaide, 0.95 million, that's 16% increase. Perth, 1.05, this is a surprising one, 30% increase. Canberra, 1.17, 19% increase. Hobart, 0.86 million, 13% increase. Darwin, 0.7 million, that's a 24% increase. And overall, the combined capitals are likely to grow 20% or reach an average of $1.34 million. Now, if you think that this is like preposterous, we've already had a COVID boom, how can we possibly have such high rises in price growth? Again, towards the end of the video, I'll share a chart to demonstrate just how quickly house prices have grown in the past and that this isn't a new precedent at all. Units are also likely to grow at about the same rate, but this figure includes townhouses with land. So I don't change my stance on never buy a unit. I would still never buy a unit, but townhouses, well located located, established, they're still, in some instances, just as good as houses to buy. And the fundamental reason Oxford explains that house prices will grow so much is this, why it's unlikely that 1.2 million new homes will be built in the next five years. Now remember, this is the government's target to basically alleviate this housing shortage that we have, not enough houses for the demand that we have both locally and from international migrants. But remember, this 1.2 million figure, that's not a step up on what what we've achieved in the past, that's just basically a continuation of how much we've built pre-COVID time. So in my estimation, it's not high enough to begin with. And we're still not going to achieve that. Australia is facing a prolonged housing crisis with projections indicating a shortfall of more than 110,000 homes from the country's target of building 1.2 million new homes by mid-2029. What's staggering is the ramp up. I'll show you that in a sec. The article goes on to say, Build Skills Australia has highlighted the need for an additional 90,000 tradespeople within the next three months alone. Their projections indicate a national shortfall of workers, necessitating an increase in construction workforce from 590,000 to 680,000. So this isn't three years. They reckon they need 90,000 additional tradespeople like builders, plumbers, uh, carpenters, you know, electricians, etc. in the next three months. And this is the very reason we're never going to hit this 1.2 million target, which is not high enough to begin with, because we've built that many in the past when we didn't have this huge immigration. Australian Master Builders Association has forecasted this shortfall in the number of houses being built. This is very important, guys. Stick with me. So this purple number is the government's forecast or prediction or hope and prayers. National Housing Accord forecast, okay? 250,000-ish 
per year. It makes 1.2 million houses over the next five years by 2029. The reality, according to the Master Builders Association, is this red. So we're in actuals right now, this blue, it's not going up. We're already behind by more than 110,000 homes this year. This shortfall will be bridged somewhat, but it takes until 2028 to actually build it. And you can see it's sophisticated analysis because it's not just leveling out. Then they reckon a new shortage will start, meaning we actually miss the mark. So here in this period from 2024 to about 2026, 2027, this is where the house prices, because of a lack of new homes, are really going to rise very sharply. Which aligns with what Oxford Economics is saying, 20% house price growth nationally by 2027. And of course, one of the biggest culprits of this housing boom that we may actually have is net overseas migration. You guys have seen this chart so many times, but just to illustrate, we get a population increase of more than 100,000 anyway from just natural increase, births minus deaths. And that's been pretty stable. And over the long term, our immigration policy has been around 200,000 a year. Of course, in COVID, it blacked out, but then we're up here and it's not likely to come down below 400 or 350 anytime soon. They're restricting the amount of students that can get visas now. And so you'll likely see this blue line come down, but it's not these students necessarily who are buying these homes anyway. It's the people on the road to PR, permanent residency. And the policy for those types of people reducing immigration has changed at all. And so we see ourselves in a position where we're like, okay, not enough supply. It's not going to change to at least three years. And even when it does catch up, there's going to be another housing shortage, according to the chart I just showed. Demand is, is fairly strong, despite the higher interest rates. And that's why you see in Australia, the Google searches for investment properties have been booming. This blue line, Australian Google searches for investment properties, three month rolling average, it's just going up through the In fact, right now, it's high higher than what it was in 2014 and 2015, which was the middle of the last huge Sydney boom pre-COVID. Right now, there's more searches for investment property related items on Google than even in the COVID boom. What does that tell you? And we see this with new loans and new mortgages and lending approvals now starting to trend up, both for investors in the blue, they've started to trend up since 2022, and also for owner occupiers. So people are coming back into the housing market en masse. And that's why national home values rose 1.6% in the March quarter, the largest quarterly increase since November. House prices not just growing, but they're accelerating. And this acceleration doesn't need to stop. It doesn't just stop automatically because house prices have already grown. You may be thinking, well, they've already grown so much, like they can't continue to grow this much. Here's some historical data from CoreLogic Perth. It grew between 2005 to, and 2008 by 60%. Brisbane grew by 37% between 2013 and 16, just three years. Sydney grew by 56%, Melbourne 39%. Between 2016 and 19, Hobart grew by 49%. 2019 to 22, Sydney grew by 41%. Brisbane, 32%. Remember, Sydney already had that last boom of 56% in the last decade. So it just carried on. 2022 to 2023, Adelaide grew by 42%. I've always said this and don't shoot the messenger, but house prices don't care about the average person's affordability. If there's enough people that can afford, there's enough well-off people, if there's enough people in the top 20, 30% of society, they can bear sufficient influence for the average mum and dad's affordability to not really matter. What to speak of those on the lower end of the socioeconomic status spectrum. It's not great for Australia as a whole to have these house price growths again and again and again, but a spade is a spade, and, and that's what's likely to happen. And see these growth numbers, they're well above 20%. Oxford Economics is only saying 20% on average, the highest is 30% over the next three years for Perth. That pales in insignificance to what you're seeing in these true boom periods for each city. And every city has its day in the sun. It's not like Sydney grows more than Adelaide over the long term. Everywhere grows at the same level, 
basically over the 30, 40, 50 year period. But what's different is timing the market to time those booms and then get compounding returns of initial quick gains. I wanna to come to a bit of a deep dive on Perth in a second, but I know so many of you out there will be wanting to bring out your keyboards and type, oh, but we're about to go into a recession. Oh, unemployment's going to go up another 1%. Oh, interest rates are likely to go up again and again. I mean, I've done videos on all of those things and huge deep dive scenarios on why unemployment can go up again 2% and it won't matter. Interest rates go up another once or twice. It won't really matter. If we go into a recession, well, on the GFC, house prices didn't really fall more than double digits anyway. So it doesn't really matter. What matters is the on the ground reality of supply and demand. But I know many of you be thinking, well, I'm kind of struggling. I'm an average sort of person. I'm struggling to pay my home loan. Surely other people are struggling. This house price growth can't occur. Look at this, and it's honestly quite surprising. The proportion of distressed listings. Okay, this is from Domain. And what's interesting to see is that, yes, interest rates started rising in 2022, and therefore the distressed listings, you know, something with mortgagee in possession or bank repossession, some keywords like that in the listings, they started to spike in basically all cities around Australia. But since the start of last year, 2023, interest rates were still rising, but these distressed listings, they started to trend down for Darwin, Brisbane, Sydney rapidly, Perth massively, Melbourne as well, but at a shallower gradient, Adelaide and Canberra were never very high to begin with anyway. So it seems that banks are doing all they can to help people repay their mortgages. People have been getting second jobs, they have enough buffers and their offsets like I've been sharing charts for many, many years. So despite interest rates being so much higher than even pre-COVID levels, a lot of these distressed listings levels are even lower than pre-COVID levels. So I don't think that another one or two interest rate rises will really take the rug from underneath the feet of these house price gains that Oxford Economics is predicting. Now, lastly, thank you if you've watched this far because this might make you a lot of money, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you know how Oxford said that Perth median prices could go to a million dollars in three years? Right now, they're about 700,000 and they've gone up between 100 and 150 citywide on average. So like I've shared with data evidence in multiple videos, this boom is not ending anytime soon for Perth. Quarterly change in dwelling values and median dwelling values for Perth suburbs. This is up to date data from CoreLogic. What's interesting for everyone who's watching or listening is that there are still properties in Perth. You know, we're not talking like regional WA here. There are still properties in Perth just underneath this 500K line. You can still buy properties in Perth for $500,000 or less. Now, of course, if you go on real estate domain, other data providers, you'll see the median value of that suburb is like 550, 600, 650, and you'll be like, oh, no way can I find any suburb with a median of under 500. But if you buy in the 10th to 30th percentile of that suburb, you should still be able to find properties under 500K. And take it from me, this is some free advice. You can either ignore it or act upon it. Those properties are not going to stay under 500k for very long. On my Facebook group, every second day I'm posting properties that clients are buying in WA, have bought and are buying under 500k. It's still possible. And I struggle to see a world where those properties don't rise by 100,000, by 200,000, maybe even more in this current Perth cycle. And that's the case for so many cities around Australia right now. Adelaide, although it's not my favorite anymore, is still going hard. Brisbane has started a new cycle last year. Melbourne, maybe just wait a little while for the ideal timing. I wouldn't be buying there right now. Sydney, very, very expensive, very low yields, unless you're just raking in the cash, super high net worth individual. I wouldn't put my money there because the yield is so low, it's gonna cost you like $50,000 a year to hold a property. I haven't covered regional cities in this video. If you want a video dedicated to regional, type regional in the comments, regional, and I'll do a deep dive just like I have today on capital cities on regional cities, but back out, zoom out, overall, I think I'm skeptical. I think it's really easy for someone like me to say, yep, property prices will boom 20% in the next two years, and Sydney will go up to two million, like Oxford saying, Perth will go up to a million. I think it's really easy for me to spruik that, but I think we have to take that with a grain of salt. There will definitely be suburbs in Australia that grow 50% or more in the next two or three years. 
And for people who know how to read data, they will find those suburbs and they'll make a ton of money. But for the average person, I think there's a real risk of buying at the top of the market right now. I see so many people buying in, in Elizabeth and Adelaide where prices have all already doubled in the last three years. I see so many people still buying in places in Perth where prices have already gone up 70, 80%. I see people buying in Brisbane where prices have gone up 80% since 2021. Yes, I agree with Oxford insofar as prices are definitely not coming down nationally in any significant way. But I think there's never been a more important time to use data to make sure you're not buying at the top of a cycle in the microcosm of a particular local government area or suburb. And so you can make sure you do benefit from these price rises that are likely to occur. And like I always say, the biggest value will be achieved if you invest in the six inches between your two ears. Make that real estate boom because that real estate stays with you for life and manifests itself in financial independence down the road. Invest in yourself because no one else cares honestly about your money as much as you do. I'll leave links below free of charge so you can do that to my podcast Oz Property Mastery with PK on Spotify and iTunes and also my Facebook group with 50,000 amazing people Australian Property Mastery with PK. Let me know what you think about this video and share it with someone who's skeptical or someone who's like a permable. Share it with someone who you think will get benefit from it. My name's PK. Hit the subscribe button. Give it a like. I'll see you next time. Thanks guys.